If you enjoy this video, please consider giving a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And if you have any ideas for future videos, share them in the comments section below. So as you listen to me and begin to comfortably fall asleep, I don't know whether you'll fall asleep faster with the sounds of my words, with the spaces between my words, or whether it'll be with the words that I use. And as you fall asleep, so I'll talk in the background and tell a story. And I'll tell a story about a man who is one of the first to start colonizing Mars. And there's only a handful of people who have started colonizing Mars. And they've been creating a, a domed Martian base. That's made with see-through aluminium that looks just like glass. And so, one morning, this man was out on his run, as he does every morning, where he runs around the inside of the dome, and he does a number of laps around the inside of the dome, and while he's running, he still hasn't got used to the fact that it feels different to when running on Earth. That each stride launches you further and is more effortless than on Earth. And so because of this reduced gravity here, He has to run and exercise for a couple of hours a day to make sure that he keeps himself fit and healthy and keeps his bones fit and healthy. And while he runs around the inside of the dome, he often finds himself gazing out of the dome gazing through the triangular windows, gazing through that see-through aluminium that looks like glass. And while he does, he sees the red planet. He sees how it looks kind of familiar but alien at the same time. That there's no life out there, on the surface. And that it looks like places he'd been to train on Earth before his trip here. And occasionally vast dust storms appear and everything gets plunged into darkness inside the dome. And so they have to use artificial light. And the dome's powered by many different power sources. They gather some of the wind. And when dust settles, that tips the propellers and also then powers them because the propellers are designed almost with little cups on them 
They're designed to be really smooth. That channels the cups to the end, channels everything to the end of the propeller. So any dust that lands on a propeller blade doesn't stick, but flows into that channel, reaches the end of the blade, creating a little bit of extra weight on that blade, making that blade lower down. And then as it lowers down, it empties the dust. And as it empties the dust, the next blade is filling up. And then that one lowers down. So it catches some wind. But even during dust storms, it can get powered by the dust itself. And they also use solar panels and have a huge array of solar panels. But those panels need wiping down after dust storms and become virtually, if not totally, ineffective during dust storms. And they've been creating other fuel with resources they've found on Mars. And part of their job is to do the research to make sure it'll definitely be self-sustaining for more colonists to come here. And the man continues running around the inside of the dome Noticing how the sun has a very slightly purple hue as it's near the horizon. And inside the dome is a comfortable temperature. And yet he's aware that outside the dome, even though it doesn't look cold, It's actually way below zero. And after his running around the dome, he then does some more exercises before having some breakfast. And after breakfast, it's his job to get on with some work and he gets into his spacesuit. He walks into an airlock as the door shut behind him. Has the section changed in pressure? Opens the other airlock and walks out onto the Martian surface. And inside the spacesuit is a speaker connected to a microphone that's on the outside of the spacesuit so that he can clearly hear what it would sound like to be walking on Mars without the spacesuit on. He can hear his footsteps. He can hear when the breeze blows against the microphone. And they've been experimenting with attempting to create life that can survive on Mars. With the plan that in centuries time they could perhaps terraform Mars. But if they can create life and plants that they can eat, that can grow in Martian soil and the Martian atmosphere, they don't then have to do all that inside the dome. They can maximize space by doing all that outside the domes. 
And so he goes over and he chisels away at some bits of stone and takes samples, puts them in a bag. He chisels away at other stone, takes samples, puts them in a bag. He then goes to different locations where experiments have been carried out, where seeds have been planted. And the seeds are unable to be watered because the water just evaporates or freezes, depending on what they do to the water. Or is far too salty. So they have to try and figure out what areas maybe a hardy plant could grow. And so he goes over and looks at one area. Nothing's growing there, so he marks that down. He goes to another area and it's the same, nothing's growing there. He goes and checks out another area and nothing's going, growing there. And then he checks in an area that is just inside a nearby cave just in the mouth of a cave. And he notices the tiniest of little bits of life. He notices some small leaves just poking out of the ground. And somehow this is able to survive here. Perhaps because it's just out of the radiation. Maybe in this cave area there's a little bit more moisture just under the ground near enough for the roots to reach. Whatever the reason there seems to be a bit of life here. So they take a sample of this bit of soil that they can analyze and try and work out what's different about this specific location. And if it works out in this location, the difficulty is that it's not so scalable because they can't just grow all the plants in caves and the plants would probably still need some kind of sunlight for photosynthesis. But something he notices while he's checking in the cave is that there's something on the walls. It looks like it's a bit slimy and it's something that perhaps is growing without photosynthesis. And he doesn't know whether it's something that's naturally Martian or something that has got there from Earth. But he knows it's not part of the experiment. And he knows if he hadn't walked into the cave just that little bit further than usual and hadn't been near the side, he perhaps wouldn't have noticed in the dark cave that there was this stuff on the walls. And he knew that on Earth there are some things that survive without photosynthesis. And so he takes a sample that he can take back to be analysed back in a lab, back in the dome. 
and he carries on his rounds and finds nothing else. And he quite likes walking around on the Martian surface. He doesn't mind it in the dome and being able to look out over the surface. But he feels trapped when he's in the dome. Because he knows there's a barrier. And yet, although he knows he's on a different planet, he doesn't feel trapped when he's walking on the Martian surface. He enjoys going on expeditions, he enjoys exploring valleys, vast ravines, tall mountains and ancient volcanoes. He enjoys having that sense of awe and wonder that everything is so big at times that you don't feel like you're trapped somewhere. And he enjoys at night where you get the most beautiful views of the night sky. Views you could never get on Earth. And so he heads back to the dome. He shares his findings. And then he starts working on that discovery, on that life he found. And in a lab, he takes a small amount and he extracts some of the DNA. And he finds it's subtly different in how it's made up to DNA he's used to seeing under a microscope. And so they analyze the DNA in more detail. And it doesn't quite match how DNA is done on Earth. And he realizes there's a very good chance this isn't Earth life. And that they thought that there was no life on Mars. And that there certainly wasn't any life on the surface of Mars. And yet near the surface where it's sheltered from solar rays, from radiation, inside caves, there's this life, a slimy kind of life that just seems to grow on the rocks. And they analyze this life and they see it seems to produce a chemical that can erode the rocks ever so slightly and that erosion feeds the life. The erosion creates chemicals the life can feed on. And then the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere feeds the life further. And the life doesn't need photosynthesis. It can just live on eroding the rocks. And this type of life likely makes its own caves over millions of years by just gradually eroding the rock and then multiplying and continuing to erode the rock. And he finds this a fascinating discovery.
that somehow this life can live off of the rocks just by creating a simple chemical reaction on the surface that dissolves the rocks, that gets some iron out of the rocks, some oxygen out of the rocks, uses the carbon from the atmosphere. And it seems to be a very slow growing organism. And they continue to study this life. And now they realize that whatever they do, they can't mess with the ecosystem too much because there is actually life here on Mars where they thought there was none. And if they mess with it too much, then they may interfere with the life that's here without even realizing what they've interfered with. And also they didn't know whether this life would be any risk to colonists because of it being different and alien in relation to what human life has grown up used to. And this man found that today was probably the most exciting day he'd had here on the Red Planet. Every day had been the same. Get up, exercise, have something to eat, get in your spacesuit, go out exploring, go and do your rounds, do a bit more exploring, spend a few hours typing up and reporting on your findings, have a bit of social time and go to bed. And although he was fine doing this every day, This was something new, exciting. This was a dream that humanity had had for years of finding life on Mars. And different rovers had tried to find life in different places and had always found tantalizing hints that life had been there, but never any sign that life was there. It turns out They'd been searching in the wrong places. Now this was going to start a whole new way of viewing Mars, a whole new set of explorations, new understandings. And the man wrote up his notes. He wrote up his personal log of what he'd been up to for the day. He sent messages to his family back home to update them on his discovery. And as the Martian day drew to a close, he went and had something to eat, spent a bit of time socialising and excitedly sharing his story, his discovery, how he has probably made history here on Mars, probably the first significant bit of true, honest Martian history. And then he went to bed for the night, looking forward to waking up and continuing his study in the morning, continuing to see if other caves held life, continuing to find other caves, and see if there's other locations this kind of life could survive in. And he drifted and fell comfortably and relaxed 
asleep.